On this week's 51%, singer-songwriter Dawn Landis shares some of her favorite protest songs from the Liberated Woman's Songbook, as reimagined in her new record. Women have been active in political movements over time. There's so many. Abolitionist movement, the um, temperance movement, suffrage, uh, civil rights. They've been a part of all of these movements. So there's songs for all of those. I'm Jesse King. It's all up next on 51%. I was standing around like one of those girls I had seen in a movie The whole world was a movie back then I had my sunglasses on, I wanted to be seen without seeing Shiloh or Lita, I wasn't really in it I didn't really get it You're listening to 51%, a WAMC production dedicated to women's issues and experiences. Thanks for tuning in. I'm Jesse King. It's been a big week for reproductive health news in the U.S. Since the Supreme Court's decision to overturn Roe v. Wade in 2022, more than 20 states have moved to ban or heavily restrict access to abortion. As of this taping, lawmakers in Iowa have developed a framework for a six-week abortion ban if it gets approved by the Iowa Supreme Court. And in Arizona, the state Supreme Court has given the go-ahead to revive an 1864 law that predates the state, banning nearly all abortions. We'll have more on these updates in the coming weeks, along with our series on endometriosis. Today, we're bringing you a conversation with singer-songwriter Don Landis, whose new record revives some protest songs that are about as old as Arizona's abortion ban. Landis is originally from Louisville, Kentucky, but also spent much of her life in Brooklyn, New York. She has toured as an instrumentalist with Sufjan Stevens and the Roots band Hem, and has shared the stage with artists like Andrew Bird, Jose Gonzalez, The Weaker Thans, and Ray LaMontagne. Landis recently spoke with WAMC's Sarah LaDuke. Her newest and sixth record is a cover album of the Liberated Woman's Songbook, first published in 1971, just a few years shy of Roe v. Wade. Some of the protest songs selected by Landis are more than a century old, but she found many of them are still relevant today. I, I've been carrying around a copy of this songbook, and the songbook came out in 1971. I don't remember exactly which used bookstore I was in when I found it. I think I must have been traveling. You know, I, I usually when I'm touring, I like to find like you know a good coffee shop, a good thrift store, and a good bookstore. <laughs> so who knows which where I unearthed this one? But it's it's such a great artifact. I mean, it's, it's, you know, it's so seventies, the, the cover is so provocative and there's this woman on the cover. She kind of reminds me of Michelle shocked a little bit, you know, Mm -hmm. and um, she's pointing and she's got glasses and a leather jacket on and, and it's got this woman slash man ambiguous symbol that also kind of looks like a banjo. All of it is just wonderful. And the font is, is really cool. I don't know. It just, the cover really drew me in. And then the contents, you know, it's, it's 77 songs about women's rights, essentially, like folk songs dating back to the 1800s until the 1970s about women's activism. And that's how I first discovered it. And then I just carried it around for many years and sort of, I don't know, treated it like a coffee table book or something. You know, there's really cool photographs and interesting histories of the songs, but I never really bothered to learn the songs until a few years ago when I felt like I needed to do something Right. Why? <laughs> what? What has been going on recently that has made you feel like you needed to do something? What are the the elements of the news cycle and life on Earth that launched you into working on this record? When the Dobbs decision to revoke Roe and to revoke women's reproductive freedom, when that leaked, I I sort of knew it was coming, but it was shocking to me, and and I felt really, I think, like a lot of female friends of mine, I felt unhinged and 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 sort of voiceless betrayed Betrayed and that your rights are being revoked i've never had that happen to me and i don't think it should happen (laughs) you know i just really don't think it should happen um it's the opposite of progress right we're just regressing i stayed up all night and it was the pandemic my tours were canceled and i just looked to this book i found this book and i i started learning a song a day i sit at the piano and the guitar and just the titles and the lyrics that spoke to me, I would learn those. And the book, there are three sections. The first section is about sort of domestic life. The second section is songs of the struggle. And the third section is called 
they did their thing, which I think is hilarious, but it you know, is, yeah. prof <laughs> it's, it's biographical songs, you know, a song about Amelia Earhart, but I, I didn't go into that section at all. Really, I gravitated towards songs of the struggle because I was struggling. And yeah, I picked 11 of them with my producer, Josh Kaufman, who's wonderful. And uh, we kind of went back and forth about, you know, I had, there were a bunch of them that spoke to me, but we wanted it to be a very diverse collection of songs. I could have just made a whole album of labor songs because women have been active in political movements over time. There's so many abolitionist movement, the um, temperance movement, you know, suffrage, uh, civil rights, you know, they've been a part of all of these movements. So there's songs for all of those. Let us go in on some of the songs. I want to start with the one that has been the one for me, um, the one that I've listened to the most since you sent me the the early listening, and that is The Housewives Lament. I really, really love it. I love what I I felt sort of um, proud of my listening ears because I can hear Josh Kaufman's work in it yes. as well yeah. as you're as you're singing in your lyrics and you know everything you did. But I can like hear those long, kind of sustained organ sounding kind of chords he puts in, mm -hmm. and I really love the the message. And I felt sort of you know wistful and sad as I listened to it. And and will learn it and sing it in my car. Tell me about oh. your your relationship to the song now that I've spilled mine oh that well it's funny that's the first song that we collaborated on for this project and it is a true collaboration you know josh and i have played music together over the years for a long time we used to tour in a band together and i played music with his wife annie who's also mm -hmm. all over the record she's singing and playing bass and we're just old friends and and it really was lovely to collaborate like this he brought such a mood to the song. You know, I had been singing the song a cappella on my own and had been messing around with some things, but he really he really found um the essence, I think, of the song. There are other recordings of this song out there, and some of them are lovely, but they're very playful. And I feel like it doesn't touch the gravitas of the lyric. Like the lyrics were written in the Civil War era by a woman. They were found in her diary, and her name was Mrs. Sarah A. Price of Ottawa, Illinois. And uh, I can't find anything about her. There's and there's nothing out there about her other than this beautiful document of her lament. You know, it's called the housewife's lament. And she had a reason to lament. She lost seven of her children. She outlived seven kids and lived through the Civil War. And, and she had a rough life. And it just she writes about it so beautifully. I also just really res respond to to this one too and we put out a music video for it yesterday so you can check that out too there's too many hours we spend getting ready days of our lives spent ironing a shirt there's nothing that pays back time wasted already nothing that lasts but trouble and dirt oh life is a toil love is a trouble Beauty will fade, prices will double, pleasures will wane, riches will flee. Nothing is as I wish it would be. That is a portion of The Housewives' Lament as recorded by Dawn Landis for her new album, The Liberated Woman's Songbook. It's beautiful stuff, Dawn. I'm so glad to be speaking with you about it. I'm so glad it exists. Speaking of music videos, which you mentioned, you put out a video for that one. There is also a video for Heart is the Fortune of All Womankind. In this video, you are, I would say, acting. You are dancing. <laughs> you are in costume. Not that you've never done anything like this before, but it, it looked like quite a quite a thing. Okay, well, for those of you who have not seen the video, please go check it out. I, I'm really proud of it. Heart is the fortune of all womankind. She's always controlled, always confined, controlled by her parents until she's a wife, a slave to her husband the rest of her life. That was the first single we released for the album, and it's the oldest song of the collection. So this one's from around 1830. In the songbook, in Jerry Silverman's songbook, there are all these really really amazing photographs. And so I chose 
think five or six of the photographs. And I worked with a photographer who's incredible, Heather Evan Smith. And we recreated all of those photographs with me in those settings. Mm -hmm. um, and I got like costumes from the local uh, Playmakers Rep Theater here in North Carolina, lent us some costumes and uh, the filmmaker, Sandra Cather Davidson, we all worked together to recreate these scenes from history. And it was really fun. <laughs> There's so many funny things happen. You know, one of the scenes, I'm a suffragette. I'm carrying a protest sign that I handmade and put together um, with my friend. It says, Mr. President, how long must women wait for liberty? And I was marching around in period costume. And what we we're trying to find the perfect location to shoot. And I was walking around. It was very hot. And I was walking around downtown Raleigh carrying this giant protest sign in very uncomfortable shoes and like nylons and everything. And I had people coming up to me thinking I was a historical reenactor. <laughs> sure. and, and also I had people asking me for pamphlets. They said, do you have a pamphlet? <laughs> <laughs> I need to start carrying around pamphlets. Yep. Yeah. You know, but it was really a great conversation starter. And I still have the sign. Actually, I'm going to, I'm going to use it in a, a, an art rally, like here, you know, and I have to think of other uses for this sign. I need to start carrying the sign around more But And then another one was I recreated a scene from the 1968 Miss America protest in, in Atlantic city. And um, I'm carrying um, this rather offensive ad for a steak company that we also recreated, which was wild. Mm -hmm. Um, but I'm carrying a poster of this and we go to the Capitol building to shoot this. And there's a, a group of women, this, these older women, and they're protesting one of the house reforms and they all have their printed out signs. And I asked to take a picture with them and they remembered that ad. I bet. Yeah, I know. I know. I couldn't believe it. I was like, this is amazing. This is so wonderful that like, these are my people that are here <laughs> yeah. with your printed out like eight by 10 signs, you know, and we got a picture together and that was really great. It just ties it all together for me. And it felt really, <laughs> really vital, like a, an idea that is just really in the air right now. Your wagon needs grease and your whip is to mend. Come sit down here by me. Art is the Fortune of All Womankind from Don Landis' new album, The Liberated Woman's Songbook. We've mentioned that the last song was from about 1830. Housewives Lament is from about the 1860s. You have the songs in order of when they were written. Why is that a choice that you made? Well, the book is structured, as I said, in, in three different categories. But for me, I really felt it was important. I don't know why. I felt it was important for me to know when these songs came about. And you know, a lot of them are traditional songs. So they just say song and then in parentheses, traditional. Um, but I wanted to know more. So I did a lot of research. That was the hardest part of this project for me was trying to find the dates. I had to do pretty extensive research. I went to the Southern Folklife Collection at UNC. They have some great materials. And then I had, there was a Sally Bingham feminist archive of lots of cool stuff and material um, at Duke. So I really had to do a lot of digging to find the dates and to find out what was happening to contextualize these songs. What was going on? You know, who wrote these? When were they being sung? What was happening that inspired these things? Because, I, and then I wanted to like lay them all out in a sort of timeline just to help myself feel better, to, to just look at the progress of women over time and, and just how far we've come. We've come really far. I mean, I learned some amazing things. Like women didn't have the right to their own children. You know, they couldn't get a credit card in their own name until 1974 after Roe v. Wade. Like, you know, this is wild. Yeah. yeah. So many things that um just blew my mind. And uh so I'm grateful that I can still get a credit card. You know? <laughs> For now. <laughs> For um, now. In recording songs from previous generations there's a, a legacy of powerful women's folk 
authorship involved in the record? How else are you honoring that as you work on the project? Well, you know, the song, the songbook was published in 1971. So that leaves out a lot of music, right? There was so much music that was created during the height of the women's liberation movement and beyond. Um, and I've been really lucky because I've been able to work with some incredible women who were producing music of the genre at the time. When we did the first performance of this last April, Alice Gerard came out on stage at the end of the show. And we talked a little bit about what was going on at the moment, you know, when this book was published for her. And um, if you're not familiar with her, she's a bluegrass pioneer. Um, her and Hazel Dickens wrote some incredible music and we're, we're really like one of the very first female fronted bluegrass bands. Alice is amazing and she just released a record. She's turning 90 this year. She's such an inspiration and it's been so fun to get to know her and get to work with her. And she's a really big supporter of this project. Uh, I've talked to her a lot about this and she's been very encouraging. And then um, I'm doing a show in London in at the Barbican in, in September and I'll be joined by Peggy Seeger. That's She's incredible. also just shy of 90 and is still releasing music and still out there being a badass. So, you know, it's just, it makes me feel, I, I just didn't know what to look forward. I didn't know I had so much to look forward to when I look at these women and see their careers and see what they're doing today. It's, it's really inspiring. In 100 years, what a change will be made in politics, morals, religion, and trade. In leaders who teeter and tiptoe the line, things will improve in 100 years time. The second song on the album is 100 Years, and it is about things being better, looking forward 100 years and things being better. It's written in or around 1852, yeah. which is well over 100 years ago. Yes, but some was. of the things, of course, that the lyric mentions have not mm. been remedied the way we would wish and you do sound kind of mad in the song a little bit oh, mad. really interesting yeah. <laughs> I feel I feel optimistic singing that song actually Good. that's interesting that you say that I mean I think those lyrics are so in amazing to me Fanny Gage uh Frances Dana Gage was her full name she was a playwright and an activist and an abolitionist in Ohio in the 1850s and she really did a lot or tried to do a lot for women's rights. You know, she tried to change policy and, and, you know, really advocated for so many specific changes that never happened in her lifetime. Mm -hmm. um, but this song is very hopeful. Um, and I think about lyrics from it constantly. There's one line, let's see, in 100 years, what a change will be made in politics, morals, religion, and trade. You know, just dreaming of, about the future. Um, our prisons will be converted to national schools. I think about that line all the time. Woman, man's partner, man's equal shall stand While beauty and harmony govern the land To think for yourself will not be out of line The world will be smart in 100 years' time And, and, and in 1952, you know, some of those things had had happened. There were there was progress, but you know, not a, not all the dreams that she had came true. We're still working on it. I love the version that you have on here of "Which Side Are You On." Who joins you on that vocally? That's the most familiar, I think, song to people, and um, that was a labor song written by Florence Reese in the 1930s, uh, in response to the the coal miner strikes in bloody Harlan County, Kentucky. But I kind of made a mashup of two labor songs from the exact same time period. The other one is written by Aunt Molly Jackson. It's I Am a Union Woman. In this song, in this version of the song, I'm singing the Florence Reese, which side are you on part? And then Kaneen Pipkin from The Lone Bellow is singing mm -hmm. the Aunt Molly Jackson part. So the two of us are singing together, which is really fun. Yeah, She's amazing. It's, it's beautiful. Don't scare for the bosses.
And I want to wrap up our conversation by playing a bunch of Liberation Now, the last song on the album, uh, written in around 1970. Tell us about this song a little bit before we send you off to fight the good fight. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, great. Okay. Well, yeah, Liberation Now, it was written in 1970 for the Women's Strike for Equality to celebrate the 50th anniversary of women getting the right to vote. And it was co-written by Betty Friedan, who everyone, well, most people know as the author of The Feminine Mystique, Mm -hmm. and a woman named Jacqueline Reinock, who was a composer and a children's author. It was all put together by NOW, the National Organization for Women. Liberation now, liberation now, we're breaking out of our cage of our fools and rage, liberation now. Femininity, what's femininity? Masculinity, what's masculinity? It's humanity that we both share. I just love this song. Um, It's interesting because the production on the record is very spare, but I'm singing it with six women and it just feels so good to sing this song with other women. And um, when I do this performance in concert, I often am joined by other female singers. And it's just so satisfying to sing this in a group of women. But yeah, just to be in concert with all these strong women singing Liberation Now, you know, it just feels good. Liberation Now, Liberation Now. We're more than mothers and wives with secondhand lives. Liberation Now. That was Don Landis speaking with WAMC's Sarah LaDuke. Her new record, The Liberated Woman's Songbook, is out now. You can learn more about her work at dawnlandis.com. Liberation now, liberation now. It's time for women and men to walk hand in hand. Something a little bit more cheerful, maybe, before we go. This week, millions of Americans experienced a rare total solar eclipse crossing North America. This year's eclipse was special, as the path of totality was wider than in previous years, and the next one in the U.S. won't be for another 20 years. So for many, it was important to make the most of it. WAMC's Samantha Simmons brings us the story of an Albany, New York couple who, after losing touch for decades, finally reconnected and tied the knot under totality. Charles Joseph Berry, you take this woman to be your wedded wife to live together in the estate of matrimony, Will you love, honor, and keep her in sickness and in health, and forsaking all others, keep yourself only unto her as long as you both shall live? I do. As the sky went dark, the light of love shined for the berries at Scotia Village Hall. For seven years, 62-year-old Lisa Ann Sokolowski and 63-year-old Charles Berry have lived together in Albany. Over time, the friends realized that living their lives together was easy. Charles who has suffered several heart attacks in recent years. So since moving in together, they've become each other's emergency contact. Lisa Ann says it felt like the right time. We're not going anywhere. We're not going away from each other. We're not looking uh, elsewhere. Let's, Let's also just make it easier as we hit this age and mortality and and fragility starts to knock a little bit on the door. Being married makes me feel confident knowing that I can fearlessly go into any ER or hospital and say, I'm his wife, I want to see him now. But how did they get here? A phone call in the late 2000s, but it all started well before that. Charles had transferred to Greenville Central High School in the Hudson Valley because his parents thought he would become a wild child if they didn't move. Charles says on his first day, he walked in and saw a beautiful girl with a great smile. Lisa Ann says he became her hero. Back then, uh, in the 70s, the big thing was your boyfriend, you know, escorted you from class to class. So I always had him with me. And then uh, from from where I lived in Earlton to Burn was probably a good, oh, 25 miles round trip. 
and my parents indulged driving me out on New Year's Eve to go spend it with him at his parents' house. They dated on and off in high school. It would usually be about nine months on, two months off, and then come back around again. And, and, and then it would be, excuse me, but you've been holding on to my Donna Summer Live album now <laughs> for eight weeks, and I would really like to hear it again. But like most high school couples, they went their separate ways for college. We didn't have cell phones back then, so once you moved away, you know, and you know, you're not in your parents' house anymore, it was hard to reconnect after we, after we left Albany. Charles went to work in show business traveling internationally to model design and even helping the late Princess of Wales pick out her jewelry for the 1996 Met Gala, famously paired with her so-called revenge dress. At the same time, Lisa Ann was working in local journalism before moving to New England, where she eventually got a gig as an equestrian journalist. While living in New York City, Charles went to a play with old friends Dennis McDermott and John Emmett. McDermott now lives in Paris. He and Lisa Ann went to the College of St. Rose together. He says Charles would often visit Lisa Ann at school. At the play, McDermott asked if anyone had stayed in contact with her. Charles said he hadn't, but he never forgot about her. McDermott says in 1981, it seemed like they were married. In a message to WAMC, McDermott said, I'm glad they finally did something about it. They complete each other. McDermott shared Lisa Ann's number with Charles, and the rest is history. Soon after, Lisa Ann was on the train to see him. Of all of the 365 days of the year that I could have chosen to have come down and to have seen him again for the first time in three-plus decades, turned out to be the anniversary of Cherry's passing. In 2001, Charles's long-term partner died from HIV complications. Charles said it changed him in how he viewed relationships turning him into a hard person. I could see that kind of seeping out a little bit, and I didn't like that. You know, I, 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 you know, I never, I didn't, I didn't operate on that level. Uh, I didn't like sort of being curt with people or not wanting to, you know, I didn't, I started not wanting to be around people. That all changed when he saw Lisa Ann at the train station. When I first saw her, and I'm not making this up. Yes, it was a it was a gray day, but the lights from Grand Central when she was coming towards me, it turned into a sunny day for just you know I, I don't know how much long the or the time frame, but yes, you know, the streaming light through Grand Central at the time, and she was part of that light, and you know everything was a okay. Lisa Ann, who was in a bad marriage at the time, felt the same way. I remember it was um, a cold gray day in January and looking out the window at the, the, the gray sky and going, what am, I, what am I doing right now and why do I feel like this? Is this going to change my life? It did, but it took some time. The two remained friends for years, coming in and out of each other's lives. They say whether they realized it or not at the time, they both had careers where true friends were hard to come by and were lacking the love friendship brings. Over the holidays, they began toying with the idea of getting hitched. It was very organic how it just, you know, it wasn't a, you know, like, oh, yeah, let's do, you know, let's do this. But like, we just talked about it and, and like, uh, yeah, okay, good, good, good. And then she said, I found the date. And I was like, okay, and here we are. So, uh, you know, it was all very easy flow for me. The couple was married by village mayor David Buccifero, a family friend, before watching the eclipse from the sidewalk where they had just said their vows. I am seeing the moon passing from right to left with a big, fat, fiery crescent of sun still on one side, and that glow is just bouncing off of the sidewalk is an eerie light. It really is. Samantha Simmons, WAMC News, Scotia. She 
Thanks for listening to this week's 51%. 51% is a national production of WAMC Northeast Public Radio in Albany, New York. It's produced and hosted by me, Jesse King. Our associate producer is Jody Cowan, and our theme is Lolita by the Albany-based artist Girl Blue. Just a reminder that you can listen to 51% anytime at our website, wamcpodcast.org, or wherever you get your podcasts. And you can stay in the loop on all of WAMC shows by signing up for our weekly newsletter, Airwaves, at wamc.org. We hope you'll join us next week. Until then, I'm Jesse King for 51%. I was every single girl. I was nobody else. I was so sure of myself. I was 15 and a half. He was a hollow laugh. And I lost my cool somewhere along the way. The night bed on the hallway. I had to learn how to look away. I lost my cool.